So as mentioned, we're only going to be talking about section seven. Oh, I have that wrong. It should be eighth one. Woo. Oh, I had two pens in my hand. Sorry. So we're just going to talk about fraud and how we control that internally and who is stealing from us in this case, our employees. What are they stealing? I'd say one of three things. Cash, stuff that we're selling or inventory or supplies, okay? So what is fraud? If you do not have this, um, if you don't have this uh, vocabulary term in your notes, please add it. It is a dishonest act by an employee, notice I have employee in red because we're not talking about customers if they're stealing from us, that results in personal benefit to the employee and it's costing the employer. So I'd say again, the three, you know, they're either gonna steal cash, what is going on? I'm blaming my son, he was playing with all these crazy tools this morning. Cash, supplies, oh my, <laughs> or inventory. I don't know what's going on. I better not write. I shouldn't need to write. You just have to really, really be listening to my verbal add-ons. When you look at fraud, the chapter presents what's called the fraud triangle. And as I look at a few of your notes, I can see the fraud, tang fr fraud triangle in your notes. If not, please add it. I'm not gonna write on here because clearly that doesn't work well. Um, so please add to it as I talk about each of these. If I'm an employee about to steal one of those three things, cash, inventory, or supplies, you really can go about it in one of three ways. If the opportunity exists, it's pretty easy to do. It's there in front of me. Maybe there isn't a camera monitoring me. Maybe I'm the one that accepted that shipment in the back storage room and how are they gonna know if we're one or two shorts? Maybe I am a cashier and we share the same register cash drawer all day long and I'm gonna grab myself a 20. Who is gonna know? Because they're, I'm not the end of the shift, another employee's coming in and I can blame them. So the opportunity exists. Peek. I know. <laughs> well, this is going on YouTube. Yeah. That's pretty easy. Financial pressure, you're strapped for cash and you need it. Or you're mad. Joe Schmo over there is making two, three bucks more an hour than I am and I work harder than him. I'm going, the financial pressure's on, I need the money, I'm mad that he makes more than I do, so I'm gonna steal it. And I'm just gonna stick it to the man that way. And finally, the rationalization one's kind of the icky one. You do it enough to make yourself think it's okay. What's one pop out of the cooler? What's one swipe of a, you know, maybe I'm not gonna give that customer the change. Oh, they, they gave me a tip. I'm not going to record that. Or, you know, there's different things. So I want you to make sure, because I'm not writing these down, because normally I would, make sure you list an example for each of the broad triangle pieces. Quickly add those to your notes. When I reviewed the test, this was on there, and you had to fill in the three different parts of the broad triangle and give an example. I'm telling you, You'll see this at end of chapter stuff. Now all of a sudden some of you are writing stuff down. Good. I'll say them one more time quickly. If the opportunity is there, you can do it sneakily or maybe it's the infrastructure allows you to do that. Um, financial pressure, you need the money or you think you're being shortchanged and your buddy next to you is making two, three bucks more an hour. You're going to stick it to the man, and then rationalization, you do it enough where you think it's okay. You kind of become hardened or cold to the fact that you are really stealing. So we've identified fraud. Just grab who you need, Mr. Greenwald. 
We've identified fraud. Now let's try to decide how are we going to control this? Can we 100% control our employees? No. Can we put policies and little checkpoints in place to minimize fraud? Yes. Okay. So what is in con internal control? Control of what? Again, our cash, our merchant, our inventory, and our supplies. There's methods and measures. You basically need to safeguard your assets. You need to keep those assets in house. And you have to set up policies. And you have to set up different ways to make sure your assets are where they say they are. Your accounting records need to be right on. What if your accounting person is the corrupt one? Ugh. Yes. That is the next chapter. The question was asked, what if a business is failing financially and they allow their customers to continue to charge it? That's a problem. And in tough economic times, you're going to try to liquidate as much as you can and go after those ARs. If you read ahead, that's what chapter 9 is. How do you recover your ARs when you're struggling? And we're going to learn about new ratios on how often your ARs pay their bill and success rates, different things like that. Good. Making your overall business more efficient is another way to safeguard against fraud. So you make it hard to be sneaky or hard to have those opportunities. And finally, you make sure you're following the laws. That's how you are going to even begin to tackle internal control against fraud. Now this next slide, oh, sorry, I'm one, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. Speaking of laws, you heard about socks. Or the Sabanas, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, the Sabanas Oxley Act. Congress actually passed a law, and I think in the book it cited like 2003 or early 2000s. Our economy and our country was seeing a lot of fraudulent activity with this. You heard of big, you know, Worldcon, um, um, what was going to start with E? Um, Enron, big companies that were going under because of fraudulent stuff on the inside. And so the Congress decided um, we're going to get a law set up to stop companies from doing this. You need to know the first piece of SOX, so S-O-X, that's where they get it. It's only, um, the only businesses that are governed by it are publicly traded companies. You know, so the big ones that are not privately owned but publicly traded with shareholders, okay? It, there are requirements that you have to have policies in, in, in check for internal control. You have to have a whole system of rules and policies within your business. Um, otherwise, what are they going to do? The government will financially penalize you, okay? Uh, their, their execs and then their board of directors basically have to make sure that everyone in the organization is following these rules and you have to have independent outside auditors come in and do a checks and balances to make sure you're following the rules. And you really need to know at a core that you would be financially penalized if you're not following the legislation that goes with this act. Can they attack? The little mom and pop cupcake shop in the corner? No, because they're not a publicly traded US company. Now I'm going to get back to my handout. Find this side of your handout a list of five, a list of six that you need to memorize. So far, you have a triangle that you have to memorize the fraud triangle why employees steal. And this gets really confusing. You're going to need to know each list, but we're going to focus on one of the five component areas. 
the five primary components of internal control, so how a business is going to make sure employees are not being fraudulent. They're going to control their environment. They're going to assess their risk. They're going to look at control activities that they can put in place, be informative and be talking about them, and then constantly monitor. So that list of five you need to know are the components. Memorize them. The book in section one decided that they're going to focus their teaching efforts on just looking at this as a focus area. They're going to say, okay, out of these five components of tackling internal control and prohibiting fraud as much as you can, we're going to look at what can we control. And there becomes six control activities that become principles. There's a lot of big terms going around here. What you need to know is that there are five areas of, or five components to internal control. The book is going to just have a focus area of the control activities, then creates a list of six. Flip your pages over. The book did slides for each of these. The book outlines them and gives you examples. I wanted to solidify everything down to one chart. You're going to need to know this chart. In fact, you're actually going to have some homework tonight kind of quizzing you on these five, six, excuse me, principles. Just remember, there are five components, but they're focusing the two, like they're going to focus area on the control activities and then list six principle. So again, what I told you when you walked in here, what kind of in con internal control, and in this form it comes in, what kind of internal control activities can you do as a business to minimize internal fraud? Okay, that's our focus. Let's start with the first principle. Let's define it, and then let's list some examples, beginning with the first one. The establishment of responsibility. Write this in. Write small. You don't have a ton of space. I wanted to get it all on one page instead of spread over five, six slides. What is the establishment of responsibility? Basically, it assigns responsibility to specific employees, and it limits access to authorized personnel. That's fine and dandy. What does that mean? Write that down. As soon as I give you the examples, and some of them are from the top of my head, most of them are directly from your text. I already talked about this, but the simple idea of at a shift change in a retail setting, your shift is done, Joe Schmo comes in to do the night shift, you switch out cash drawers. That way, if the cash drawer or a money bag, whatever, is off, we can go attack whoever had that cash register at that shift time and say, why are we off X amount of dollars? But if you let that cash register just be open, shut, open, shut as the shifts change throughout the day, we can't attack one person. We can't prove that Jenny Mars was the one that stole the $20 because John Mars came in for his shift after Jenny. You can narrow it to, okay, who was at that cash register at that given, you know, on that given day. But it be, do you see how we're setting the responsibility of when, you know, and again, it's not necessarily the employee's responsibility to do it. You got to set up the policy inside of your business to say, okay, at, at a shift change, we're going to switch out money drawers. Is that a little bit cumbersome? Yeah, it is. But you're establishing that responsibility of that person goes with that cash drawer. Mitchell. Okay. Then, then whoever's counting the money drawer notices that, approaches the customer, and then the customer's like, oh yeah, that one customer, I screwed up the change. 
well, then they got to work that out. But at least what this what this principle is talking about is that shift change, the cash register drawers change. So it's just establishing that responsibility that goes with it. Um, I did this when I worked at Herberger's right when I started teaching. Um, and many of your businesses are probably the same way. Um, I worked in the back office. And so my job at the end of the night was to make sure each cash register meshed with what they said was there. So it was establishing responsibility. It was one person who was not even dealing with that given till to just double check that things shook out. Do you have to count up your cash drawers at the end of a shift or at the end of your night? Yes, some of you? Yeah? Do any of you work in a job where you switch out the cash drawers when different people come on? It, logistically, it's kind of annoying. Because you got to have a couple extra cash drawers sitting around, and then that means you just have that much more cash on site for the external people to come steal from. Not that hard, though. Most of these cash registers, it just pops out, and the other one pops in. Yep. The next of the six principles segregation of duties. This definition's a little bit wordy. The examples are going to make a lot more sense. It's where different individuals should be responsible for related activities. The record keeping of an asset should be kept separate from the physical asset. Okay, so let's talk about this. The person who designs the accounting software shouldn't be the one using it day to day because then they could build in little ways to you know, shuffle a couple cents here or a couple dollars here for every transaction. Watch the movie Office Space and you'll know what I'm talking about. It's inappropriate for me to show at school, but it is exactly what I'm talking about. These people are mad at their boss and they want to stick it to the man. And so the person who's in charge of the financial software for the company builds in a little command into the program to steal a couple cents off every transaction, which ends up being millions of dollars. Watch the movie Office Space. You'll know what I'm talking about. That's what this is. And no, I can't show it to you at school. But it's very fun. Another one. Here at our school, if I want to buy something, What's stopping me from yanking one of these lights and bringing home to use it? Ethics. Okay, if someone sees me walking out with one of these lights to do some of my own photography at home, someone might say something. Now, had I been the one that purchased these lights? Had I been the one that approved the light order? Had I been the one that FedEx shipped them to? The school wouldn't have even known that I bought them. But when you segregate duties, like I can't just, I can't buy anything around here without Mr. Kehoe's approval. That's going to get rerouted down to the district office and those ladies will make the order. So now we have more hands in the cookie jar. Then when it gets delivered here, it seems to end up in the high school office. So then Rita and Jody know that I bought something. And so as more of these duties become segregated, it becomes harder to steal it. Make sense? Documentation, this one's pretty easy. Basically, have stuff documented because then it's hard, it, the paper trail won't lie. Things like getting pre-numbered documents. Think about your checkbooks. If you wrote a business check, we're going to learn more about checking accounts in this chapter, but if you wrote a business check to something, that check number is pre-numbered might be 100, the next one's going to be 101, the next one's going to be 102. It's really tough to launder that money on a pre-numbered document because there's a paper trail. The other thing is employees need to get paperwork to the right people as soon as they can. Invoices, um, bills, different um, shipping labels, get all of that. In fact, I just spent a 
couple minutes working with Jeannie today on several things down in the district office that I had to get her the paperwork that she was looking for. Okay. Things like cash register tape show all the transactions or the point of sale barcodes that people are beeping in. When, when you buy something at Willie's, Every little swipe of that barcode, get that information gets stored somewhere. It becomes harder for those employees to be fraudulent. Things like requiring a signature. Like on a big purchase, there's usually a signature required. So then if there's ever, Jenny, where did your lights go? Um, So-and-so signed for it on a given day. Why, why don't you have them? The signatures just have that people proof that someone saw the stuff. Physical controls, these are really, really easy to conceptualize. Whatever you're doing to safeguard your assets will only make your accounting records more solid. Things like, and there's lots here, putting your money in a safe or a vault. Do some of your part-time jobs have a safe or a vault where your maybe extra cash register stuff sitting? your extra money is sitting. Does everyone at your place of business have access to that? Probably not, more probably like the boss, the shift managers, the higher ups in the company, okay? Electronic time cards make it very hard for an employee to lie if they're late. M more and more are electronic. Less and less are, I showed up at 9 today, <laughs> is more like 9.20, but I'm going to put 9. If you have to punch something into a computer or throw a time card into like an automated thing, it's not going to lie for you. Do most of you deal with an automated time card? That's fraudulent if you're lying on stuff like that. Uh, locked warehouses and storage. Like the paper here at school is locked up. Yeah, Lenora's got a little stash in her photocopy area. I have a little couple boxes. What's stopping me from walking off with a ream of paper? Nothing except ethics and a few people. I didn't order the paper. So if someone sees Jenny Mars walking out of school with a thing of paper, they're going to question, what are you doing? Because I don't own that support. Apply. The school does. Um, electronic passwords. You all log into the computers here. There's a different set of logins for our administrators who work on the computer. Um, key fobs. They're looking at getting a pretty sophisticated system here at school, but there's doors that we have these little credit card looking things that allow us to just walk in with a key fob because the doors themselves you don't want to tamper with. A key fob is much more secure than an actual key. Okay. Some places even have the fingerprint scans or the eyeball scans. Um, I'm trying to think at the hospital, how do you get into the pharmacy part? It's not just a free-for-all walk-in. It might be something pretty sophisticated like what I'm just talking about. So even internally, they don't need everyone in the pharmacy at the hospital. What are you doing in here if you're not an employee or part of you know, a very personalized entrance in, like with your eyes or your... Now what's the problem with things like that, the, the optical or the fingerprint entrances? Big bucks, big bucks to set up those systems, but if you have Stuff that should be safeguarded, then it, you best get sophisticated systems. Alarm systems, <clears throat> video monitoring. You, they're running 24 hour video in this school, and they add more and more equipment every year. Pretty tough. I mean, Jenny Mars walking out with a ream of paper is going to show up on the videos. Independent verification systems. Let's get this vocab term down. It's where you review data prepared by employees. So, you know, you're checking in. Accountant, are you doing the right thing? Periodically or even on a surprise basis, whether it's internal or hired from an outside agency. The pop-ins. Auditors. 
Jeannie Monum, our financial, our, our finance director at our school here, she presented to my personal finance class last week. She spends most of the summer working with auditors with internal checks and with an outside auditing agency to make sure that her books are accurate. So independent verification system. You see Mr. Kehoe pop into classrooms. He's checking up on me. Sometimes I know when he's coming. Other times I don't. He's indep independently verifying that I'm doing what I should be doing. Finally, human resource controls. Bonding is a fancy word where you actually take out insurance that protects you from employees stealing from you. Rotating an employee so they're not always doing the same thing. It's so much easier to steal if they're always doing the same thing. Requiring them to take a vacation. I'll get into that one in a minute. Or doing thorough background checks. It basically, and it's, I know it's covered, don't hire bad eggs. If they have a track record of theft or have a track record of fraudulent behavior, don't hire them. And then if you do notice something suspicious is going on, you know, you say, hey, Jenny, take a couple days off. Require them to take a vacation. And if all of a sudden the fraudulent activity is no longer happening, it's pretty easy to corner Jenny and say, I think you're stealing from us. Because when we made you take a vacation, things were fine. Or if you have employees rotate around and do different jobs, it's going to be easier to pinpoint that bad egg. Quickly, and the internet was down when I created this, but I will get this up on my website, but quickly jot down this list. I want you to take what you just heard. You read about it yesterday. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. It was yesterday. Yes, yesterday. You read about it yesterday. You learned more about it today. Now take the learning and the reading and try to muddle through brief exercises one through five. It talks a little bit about the fraud triangle. It talks about what internal control even is. And then you have to take these six principles and apply them to situations. Remember, there's five components. The chapter is choosing to have the focus area of control activities, then which produces six principles. Tomorrow. And Friday, we'll get into section two. I'll talk about more about cash, but then we're going to actually start doing some transactions. What does it mean to establish a penny cash fund or replenish it? What does it mean to be short or over with your cash, and how do you journalize that? I think we'll span that over two days, though. The last thing that I want to address is we're going to stick with our schedule that's set. I know when you're going to be gone now, you guys have a busy March. That's good. That's a good thing. And so we're going to stick with our schedule, and we'll, we'll accommodate around your busyness. Bad egg. Don't hire bad eggs. <laughs> 